Let's worship God. Let's stand with our masks on and give it loudly and sing Hymn 582, O Day of Joy and Wonder. come to God with a prayer of adoration, meaning recognizing the greatness of God and also our joy or our, our, our prayer of confession, really meaning that we're not perfect, nobody's perfect and we mess up sometimes. And it's good to talk to God about when we do that. And recognize that we've done wrong things, said wrong things, and seek forgiveness. So let's have a chat with God. Let's pray. We always rejoice in the Lord, for our great God is always with us. The God in whom we place our whole trust. The God who made all things. The God who knows our thoughts and understands what goes on in our minds and our hearts and enables us to become the people that we were meant to be. For our God draws us home. We ask your forgiveness God because sometimes we are a wandering people. We come before you now bringing prayers and requests to you but we wonder is this just when we need you and we've nowhere else to turn but when times are good and life is great and easy we sometimes pack you away with all the other sentimental things that we keep locked away in our little just in case box help us not to be like that loving god we want to bring to you our own personal prayers for forgiveness and in this coming moment of silence, we want to lay before you the wrongs and injustices that we've had a hand in. Things said or done that really when we sit back and think about it, we shouldn't have. And also the opportunity to do good things and the right things, but these opportunities were missed. So here now are personal confessions in the quiet.
forgive us for these times that we've mucked up God and draw us close to you teach us your way so that we might follow it help us to walk in your company and know that you are with us from the moment we awake until we lay our heads to rest in Jesus name Amen let's pray and let's have a wee prayer for that country called Afghanistan let's pray loving God your hands have made every bit of our world of our planet and the beautiful land of Afghanistan is as precious as every other place on your planet by its rivers and mountains its fields and gardens its busy towns and ancient villages it's the heart's desire of its people and a place where their lives and loves are nurtured we're sad today for those who grieve over Afghanistan the people who call it home the people exiled or who have suddenly had to leave it and the men and women from other countries who have made sacrifices in these recent years in the cause of that country's future we remember with sadness the loss of lives of military people during the years of this country's involvement in Afghanistan conscious of the questions that must today be troubling the minds of those in our community who are who have lost somebody those who are wounded and those who are forever changed by experience suffering there god we pray for peace dignity freedom and confidence for the men women and children of afghanistan for courage vision and generosity within the international community responding to their needs and for the peace of mind amongst our own service community and its wider family we ask you to watch over Afghanistan and help our leaders to find positive solutions to the difficulties it's facing in Jesus name Amen when I needed a neighbor M five hundred and forty four.
let's sing hymn 608 again standing spirit of truth and grace of a blether with God. Let's pray. When God, we come to hear your word, we ask that you open our ears, our hearts and our minds to think about what it is that you want us to do with our lives for humanity in the coming weeks. So let's hear God's word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you a crossword clue. The crossword clue has eight letters. And the clue is what does James, the writer of the New Testament reading that we just heard, think that true religion is all about? Eight letters. What does James, who we just heard, read it from, think that true religion is all about? The book of James, the epistle of James, to give it its fancy word, is one of the books of the Bible that almost didn't make it into the Bible. You see, it certainly didn't appeal to some of the bishops who made up the original lists of holy books for what we now call the New Testament. One of the most famous critics about the inclusion of the book of James was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther called the book of James the Gospel of Straw. You see, Luther's concern was that it seemed to contradict what Paul was said about justification, another fancy word, or salvation through faith. And even today, there are some more orthodox Christians 
who continue to be really uncomfortable with what's written in the book of James. And there are even some ministers who say that they've never, and they never will, preach on the book of James. And for those who love the finer points of theology, those modern day critics might well feel that they have some justification for thinking that way. You see, in the writings of James, he seems to have absolutely no interest in the parts of the faith that require great learning. It would be hard, for example, to imagine James taking part in discussions about intellectual theology. Not for James any consideration of important matters, he said with his tongue firmly in his cheeks, about how women should dress and behave in church. Not for James the slightest concern about the colour of the vestments, or even the vexed matter of who is worthy to administer or receive Holy Communion. And it would be hard to think of James having the slightest interest in denominational Christianity. The theologians who criticise James appear to think that he's saying, by your good deeds alone, you can get into heaven. As it happens, if it's worth anything coming from me, or not a huge authority, I disagree with that. I think what James is saying, that it makes no sense to be a hearer of the word if you don't at the same time let yourself become a doer of the word. Or to change the metaphor, if we look into a mirror or check to see what others think about us, it is true that we might have a clearer idea of how we may well be as an individual, but there's little point in letting the mirror help us with our own perception unless we're going to do something about the self-image that it shows. James's theology is only theology at its most basic level. But just because it's simple, it doesn't mean that it should be set aside. If James, sorry, if Jesus could summarize the entire law with the two commandments focused on love, and if Paul could rank the expression of love as the greatest of the three things that will last forever, then is James doing anything different by grounding the expression of the love in action? True that from his writing, we might all need to concede that James would not likely pass a theology exam. But on the other hand, we ought to be able to imagine James as a very practical, mission-focused leader. Whereas a Pope might make deeply authoritative statements about things like the Assumption of Mary or transubstantiation of the elements, or alternatively an Archbishop in the Anglican Church might give a Bible-based opinion about the troubling issue of what rank a woman should be entitled to assume in the church hierarchy, James appears to be giving his attention to the mundane and is going on here about nothing more significant at the end of the day in this story about the treatment of widows and orphans. Let me go back to the beginning. Have you got the crossword clue yet? The example of pure and undefiled religion in God's sight, at least as far as James is concerned, is nothing more or nothing less than going to the aid of widows and orphans in their distress. If we were to go back a little in history, we'd probably see, soon see why James was focused on widows and orphans. Because in an age where way back when he lived, where only the man of the household might be expected to get meaningful employment, it was hugely misfortunate to suddenly find a family without a male breadwinner. And according to those who wrote the Bible, 
There are a number of different references to the plights of windows and the fatherless. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, it talks about the rule of the Jewish nation, which insists the picking over is what left after the harvest of grapes, olives and wheat, saying that that should be set aside for widows and orphans. God is also described in one of the Psalms as one who is concerned about orphans by using the term the father of the fatherless. And Jesus himself uses much the same metaphor when he assures his listeners, I shall never leave you fatherless. We would also do well to remember that even in countries like our own, our United Kingdom, it wasn't all that many years ago that widows and orphans were at the total mercy of an unfeeling society. The widows were the ones who might only survive in the poorhouse, and orphan children were assumed to be virtually free slave labour for the mines, factories and chimneys. And there are some commentators who would suggest that it might have been the advances in technology and nothing to do with the application of Christianity that released these orphans from their bonds. Unfortunately, even today a very unequal set of varying circumstances ensures that the problems of many orphans are still by no means entirely addressed. The modern equivalent of what James was responding to this can be seen in what happens where a large-scale disaster strikes an area, where there are few social protection measures in place. Remember AIDS? To us, something that's way, way back. Well, it's still seen in some bits of Africa as having a high number of unfortunate children who are contracting or who have contracted AIDS. And they're not very popular because of that. And we might also reflect on war orphans. Or what about the huge number of child sex slaves? We might also remember those orphaned by chemical disasters or areas where nuclear accidents have taken place. I suspect if James was writing today, he might still be talking about orphans. And yet as you read on into the book of James, he was concerned for a number of other practical issues. And if we extend his principle of caring for those in trouble to caring for those now currently in trouble, I would imagine that James would be making some very direct and indignant statements about the continuing growing gap between the rich and the poor that we find in operation in virtually every developed nation today. When I was in my late teens, early twenties, only a couple of years ago, there was a theatre company called the 784. Some of you might remember it. And it was called 784 because it stood for 7% of the population owned 84% of the wealth in this country. 7% owned 84%. Let me give you another figure, a more up-to-date one. Half, 50% of the world's net wealth belongs to 1% of the poor world's population. Half of the world's net wealth belongs to the top 1% of the world's population. James doesn't spell out precisely how we should be caring for the widows in distress, or for that matter how we might care for any others, like new immigrants, or those who are unskilled or unemployed. It's true that sometimes it's too embarrassing to insist that we are called to address serious problems when the real solution might mean first acknowledging 
But the problems only got that way in the first place as a result of community's neglect. Why is it that for centuries there have been problems for the widows and orphans? Surely, if you think about it, in part it was and has been because no one acted to put sufficient safeguards in place. And they were truthful with, it, with ourselves. Those who should have acted are probably people like us. Why is it that in the most productive and advanced nations, the distribution of resources is so, so unequal? Surely, in part, it's because those like us allow those who govern us to set the rules to advantage those most likely to vote for them, us. So James is right to remind us to attend to the tasks our faith claims to be important. Our only question can be about which tasks actually matter. As society has changed and developed, problems grow in unexpected areas. And if we care for our neighbours, we need to constantly rethink how our priorities, our priorities, need to be adjusted. So if the occasionally unpopular James is right, we can understand some in the church feeling a bit uncomfortable. It's one thing to see ourselves as Christian and to ask our leaders to help build our understanding of church history and theology. It's quite another to see ourselves as James would have seen ourselves as being required to be practitioners of compassion. To follow James, pure and undefiled religion is visiting the widows. And I guess that for today he would be looking at doing something for any of a host of our neighbours who are getting a raw deal of things. In short, if you would prefer the answer to the crossbow clue expressing in our actions that single word, eight letters, what James sees religion as being about. K I N D N E double S Kindness. The challenge that James lays down for us is a simple choice. Do we want to join the critics in claiming the inclusion of his letter in the Bible as being a mistake? Or do we want to accept his simple message and act accordingly? Let's think of it. Amen. Let's stay seated and listen to two verses of Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
did stand and sing our closing hymn, which is one of my favourites, hymn 259, Beauty for Brokenness. crossword puzzle. Kindness. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with one each of one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.